education, um, climate, water supply, social values, agricultural oh. needs, municipal and, and industrial needs. So they kind of pull all these different levers to get these different scenarios. Um, I also wanted to point out that I had shared this graph, which was actually the projected annual agricultural supply and demand. So we were only looking at the ag supply and demand and the gap for agriculture, which is why the baseline, it's no projection at all. That's just what we have today. So in all of these scenarios, you can see that demand for ag is actually going down, um, which makes a lot more sense now that we're, we know what this graph is. <laughs> and this is the supply and demand for municipal and industrial diversions. So um, dark red is the demand and the light orange is the gap under these different scenarios. So, and then this is them together um, with the different scenarios. So green is the ag demand, orange is the municipal and industrial demand. And then these lines here are the incremental gap in dark blue and the light blue is the total gap. And again, the baseline is where we're at today. And these different bars show the different scenarios, what the supply demand gap will be in 2050. So just wanted to put that up there since there was a little bit of questions about that. And I did not do a great job answering those questions last week. So that information is there for you. Um, also, before we get started uh, with our guest speaker today, um, you will need to soon decide on what your final project will be for the class. So you need to decide if you're going to do a final paper, which is two to four pages. Um, there's instructions in the syllabus for that. Or if you're going to do the Your Water, Your Life contest that there's a link to, you, you can check it out. Um, you have to submit your application for that contest by September 30th. So I want you to decide if you're going to do a final paper or that project by September 12th which is next week. Um, I've made a little, it's a survey in Canvas. So if you go to quizzes, there's a survey there and it just says, I'm gonna do a paper or I'm gonna do this other project. Just so I know then um, if you're gonna do the one, your water, your life contest, I'll just need to work with you a bit more throughout the semester to, to get that done. Um, okay, I think that is all and I'm going to, introduce our speaker here. I'm also going to make sure that I'm sharing the right screen with our Zoom folks. Okay, so I am so pleased to invite today Jennifer Gimble. She is a senior water policy scholar at the Colorado Water Center, so she works with me, which I'm very fortunate to have that be the case. Um, she has experience in water law and policy on national interstate and state water issues. She was the principal deputy assistant secretary for water and science at the Department of the Interior, overseeing the US Geological Survey and the Bureau of Reclamation. Jennifer was also the director of the Colorado Water Conservation Board, the water policy agency for Colorado. As a water lawyer, she worked for the attorney general's offices in Wyoming and Colorado. And in 2022, she received the Aspinall Award from the Colorado Water Congress. As a Terry J. Stevenson Fellow for the Common Sense Institute in 2022, she and Eric Kuhn produced a report, Adapting Colorado's Water Systems for a 21st Century Economy and Water Supply. And she will appropriately be talking with us today about water law and governance of the South Platte River. Thank you, Jennifer, Thank you. for coming. Let's give her a little round of applause. <laughs> Good to see all of you here. Welcome to water. I mean, some of you probably know a little bit more. Some of you probably don't know much, but I'm so glad you're taking this class. You're gonna find it fascinating. You have a good teacher here with Karen Schlatter. And um, I used to do this class. And so it's fun to come and just be a guest speaker and not have to do all the other stuff. So South Platte, Water Law and Governance. Hold on to your seats. This is going to be a whirlwind. You'll have the slides will be posted on Canvas and the website, as I understand. So if I breeze, if I really quickly go through something, 
you can go back and look at it. The first thing, it won't go. Not moving. Oh, there you go. I think you'll be able to do this. Yeah, you can just do that. So. Oh, okay. That's all right. Okay. First of all, I have mentioned some, uh, Karen asked for some reference materials. And here's uh, a few of them if you're interested. I highly recommend the magazine Colorado Water Law by uh, the Colorado Education Foundation, Colorado Education Water Foundation. And also, there's a book called Colorado Water Law for Non-Lawyers. And uh, both of those have been written by friends of mine. And they're really good down to down to earth basics. The last water hole in the West is about the first uh, trans basin, the first large trans basin project from the Colorado River to the South Platte Basin. You'll hear Brad Wynn talking about that and uh, when it was done. Then Confluence was just recently released here about two or three years ago by my dear friend Justice uh, Hawks. And it's the story of Grigley and the development of water. So if you like history, uh, those I, I highly recommend those. So we're gonna start with basics. There are two kinds of water law in the United States. There are riparian water rights and there are prior appropriation water rights. Riparian water rights stem from uh, English old law when they came uh, over to our country and started settling. And the riparian rights is a share and share alike. You have a right to the river if you're on the river. You have to be reasonable in your use. You have to share shortages. And uh, some states actually have permits and conditions for uh, riparian rights. However, as Karen explained last week, we had here in the West, we had a bit of a different system. Streams weren't as multiple, uh, there weren't as many, and they weren't flowing as large. And so we, as settlers came, we had the gold rush in the Rockies, and that became the basis for the prior appropriation doctrine. When you stake a claim for gold, you set your stakes, I mean, you're, you go to the office and you say, this is my claim. So you have a better right to that piece of land than anyone else. Well, the same thing happened then. It just naturally evolved with respect to water rights. And if you were the first to use water, then you got the better right. And that's where this stemmed from. It's called the Colorado Doctrine as well as um, the Pro Doctrine of Prior Appropriation. The difference between this and... The um, riparian doctrine is A, you don't have to be on the stream to take the water. You can take it and you can move it out. B, you can sell or move that water around. And C, your rights transferable. And the priority date is transferable. So we come up with a prior appropriation doctrine, and here's just the very basics of it. The earliest appropriators have the highest priority. You'll hear that as first in time, first in right. And I'll give you an example here in a minute. <laughs> Water has to be put to beneficial use without waste or speculation. Now, in the 1800s, in-stream flows were a waste. Any water that went out of state was a waste. And so as we evolved and uh, paid attention to the environment and to our neighbors, uh, we, we were able to adjust the, the definition for beneficial use. As I said, remote uses and transfers are allowed. But if you don't use that right, you lose it. You'll hear a lot of farmers talk about the fact that yeah, I could be more efficient, but if I don't take all of my water and actually put it in the field, 
then I'm going to lose that water right. So that becomes an argument all the time with efficiency in farming. So I, I found this map, I thought it was interesting. If you look at the United States, all those in red and orange, east of the 100th meridian, are riparian states. So they use the riparian doctrine, share in shortages. Most of them now have permits that are required with respect to that. West of the 100th meridian were mostly prior appropriation states. These in yellow, Texas and the Dakotas, uh, Washington and Oregon, they started out as riparian doctrine for their water law, but they changed it to prior appropriation. California and Nebraska and Oklahoma. I'm not as familiar with Nebraska and Oklahoma law, although I know you're going to have someone here from Nebraska uh, next week. California is a mess. It's a, it's a combination of riparian and prior appropriation, and Lord help you if you're a water lawyer in California. So here in Colorado, we're solid, prior appropriation doctrine. We so much liked the prior appropriation doctrine that our forefathers put it in the Constitution. So every person has a right to divert unappropriated water of any natural stream to beneficial use shall never be denied. Now, what if the what if there are too many users on the river? Well, you can still get a right. It's just going to be really junior. Beneficial use, the term evolved. Originally, beneficial uses were cows, farms, industry, um, irrigation, and power plant. That's an old power plant uh, there on the uh, Colorado River. That wasn't, that wasn't meeting society's needs. And so we have evolved to uh, also include beneficial uses as, of course, large municipalities, and they have some special rules they get with respect to that, snowmaking, in-stream flows, fishing, kayaking, um, environmental uses and uh, purposes. And that uh, lower left corner, lower right corner, is what we call a recreational in-channel diversion. A lot of cities, I think Fort Collins has one too, have uh, created these rapids for kayakers and kayaking course. I mean, there's Glenwood Springs, uh, they, they're all over the place now. That used to be considered not a beneficial use, but society demanded, we want to float those rivers. Town said, yeah, we'd like the tourism and recreational dollars that come in. So, uh, so that has evolved. Now I'm going to use some terms, uh, and Karen may have gone over this already, I don't know. But water is measured here in Colorado in, in two, two ways. First is an acre foot of water. When you look at stored water, we talk about acre feet. An acre foot is, one acre foot is, if you take a stadium, and you have foot high, fill it with water. That's an acre foot. Takes care of about um, three or four families. Cubic feet per second is a flow rate. And I had to struggle to find a way to, to visualize cubic feet per second. But it's simply a rate of um, equal to one cubic feet of water per second which is about 7.5 gallons per second. So when you're looking at a river, and, and I challenge you, when you have Corey DeAngelis here, who's the division engineer, you ask them, you know, what's the normal flow coming through Fort Collins? How much is that? Is it 35 CFS? Is it 100 CFS? And it, and it varies. But he, he can explain it far better than I can. But I did find this example. From in the USGS. If you look at this picture, on the left, that river is flowing at 25 CFS. 
25 cubic feet per second. Over here, where it's flooding, is about 6,900 cubic feet per second. So that's the difference, a little and a lot. Let me stop there and just see if there are questions. I tend to get rolling, so if you've got a question, just, just ask. I found this helpful for people who don't quite understand how this works on the ground. And Corey DeAngelis, uh, the division engineer, will give you a much better uh, idea. But I put this these slides up for professors here when I first came to CSU, engineering professors. And they found it really helpful because nobody had kind of laid it out. So here's what happens under the prior appropriation doctrine. We have two water users, a junior water user who is upstream. His water right is for 10 CFS. Senior water user downstream here. And his, is that showing? No, it's not. And his right is 10 CFS. So if that river is flowing 20 CFS, they can both have their full water. They both take their full water, right? But if that river is flowing only 10 CFS, the junior cannot pick up any water because the senior has to call, just put a call on and he gets all the water. So this is right by the junior's head. Now we have um, a lot of things that come into the mix here. Well, let me go with one more example. 12 CFS in the river, junior takes two, senior gets his 10. However, this is a famous postcard that uh, you'll find the Bureau of Reclamation. And it's, I'd rather be upstream with a shovel than downstream with the water right. So, basically saying, get that shovel and you're not getting along, you just can take the water anyway. I don't know if any of you are Steely Dan fans, but one line of one of their songs is, in the morning you go gunning for the man who stole your water. There were many feuds over, over water rights. Okay, so Karen talked about return flows. Water used up here gets reused like five or six times till it hits the Nebraska border. And that's because of return flows. In fact, when we started irrigating up here in this area and these farms were developing, the South Platte went dry at a point about around Brush, Colorado, if you know where Brush is. It just dried up. There was no more water. But as we started irrigating up here, those return flows got to the river. And now we have a continuously running river in the South Platte, which is helpful for us, our farmers and for Nebraska. We have, so we have to pay attention to return flows. In this example, let's say half of the water that the junior diverts goes back to the stream. So if there's 12 CFS in the river, the junior can divert four, which leaves eight. The sand return flows from his hill come back to CFS which then puts the river again at 10 CFS. Now for you engineers, it doesn't happen that fast. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that goes on. Now, this is really, really simple. Huh? And so there are lots of pieces to the puzzle. And I think Corey will probably talk about it. But this is just a demonstration of return flows. Do you have a question? Yeah, how does this system work in practice? Like, who tells the junior water rights? He's okay, yeah, you can divert four because we have two CMS return flows. How does that all get to the We have water cup. And I'll come to that in a minute. Don't tell Corey I said water cup. Mm -hmm. Okay. We also have what they call augmentation plans, where you can take 
from the river, even though you're out of priority. So here, the junior decides to divert five CFS. We're not going to talk about return flows. But he has some replacement water that comes in before the senior diverts his 10 CFS. Those are called augmentation plants. And there's a whole long story about augmentation plants. So if you look at the South Platte, this is a simple line diagram of the calls, the senior calls on the South Platte. Before computers, we use these line diagrams. You can see that the calls on the South Platte, 1882, 1985, 1881, very, very senior rights. And you know, they pretty much almost used up the river with those rights. Corey's gonna get you into something even more. This is a more complicated diagram. Don't bother with the details. It's just, this is, this is how they administer rights. Who's calling? Who has with what right? Who's calling? Where's the augmentation water going? So, question last week about groundwater. So I wanted to take just a couple of minutes on that. We basically have three kinds of groundwater in Colorado. Tributary, which is connected to the river. Non-tributary, and that's the, the yellow. Group. Those are all tributary. Groundwater. <laughs> non tributary where the pumping doesn't materially affect the surface water. Not non tributary which is the Denver Basin water. And designated groundwater, which is not connected at all to surface water. So Denver Basin, this is where we were growing, and we were growing fast. Municipalities were booming. They started drawing water from these deep aquifers in the Denver Basin. There's four or five of them. Most of them are, are they say they barely connected to the surface water. Not not tripping the water is, uh, is a little more connected to the surface water. So there was a decision by experts in the legislature as to how we're going to manage that water differently. So in order to pump water out of the Denver aquifer, you have to get a permit from the state engineer, which you do for any water right. And the amount of water you get is based on your land ownership over that aquifer and the hundreds, and they assumed in legislation that the aquifer would last for a hundred years. So if you had a non-tributary water, you had to replace by 2%. If you had not non-tributary, you had to put water into the stream at a rate of 4% of what you pumped. But this is Aurora, Denver, Castle Rock, Douglas County, Albert County. All of these places are just, that's the metro area. They were sucking water out of those aquifers and they can't really be replaced. So they're, they're what they call mining those aquifers. A hundred years in was decided, I think in the 60s, that was the, the number they used. It was wrong. They probably should have been using like 300 years or 400 years. And a lot of uh, individual towns now require uh, that new developers have to be ready to replace water in a in a three hundred year span, essentially. Did that answer the question on Denver Aquifer? Okay. The water comes. So we have. Uh, not only do we have to administer water rights, but we have to adjudicate them. Most of the states in the West adjudicate water rights through, through an administrative system through the state engineer's office. Colorado does not. Colorado, you have to go to court to get your water right perfected. So you have a water right. If you want to protect it, 
and make sure it's on the state engineer's list of, like, when they're calculating who gets cut off for calls, you have to get, you have to go to water court. This is the Greeley Water Court, and uh, Judge Todd Taylor is a district court judge, and his other duties is assigned as a water judge. Kevin Ryan uh, state in, is a state engineer. He heads up the Division of Water Resources. There are seven divisions in the state. Each one of those uh, basins has a water court judge, and a division engineer. And you'll be hearing from the division uh, one engineer uh, in, in the future. So what do they do? So they administer water rights. Answer your question directly. We see the river's dropping. A senior will call the division engineer say, or the superintendent and say, I'm putting my call on my 1885 call. Anybody junior to that can't take their water until his right is filled. Done a lot now with um, models. Some of these guys still walk, walk the ground, uh, ditch riders. Used to be um, these commissioners would just go out and look at the gate and see if you were taking what you were allowed. If you weren't, they'd shut it. If they came back, if the gate was up again, they'd lock it with a chain. So, um, so that's basically how it works. A very simplified effort on this. Of course, neighbors, you know how neighbors are. Sometimes they're great and sometimes not so much. They're probably the best policing we have of water rights. They know how much water you're supposed to be getting. And they watch and see what you're doing with it. So... So that's what the state engineer does. He also issues well permits, works on interstate water compact proceedings, specifically on the South Platte and other areas, monitors stream flow and water use. If you have a question about how much water is running in the river in Fort Collins, you can go to a map at the, at the Division of Water Resources. They'll show you where all the gauges are you can pick the gauge on the on the um, South Platte River going through Fort Collins, and it will tell you exactly how much water is running by at, at that point from the CFS. Lots and lots of data. Uh, the division engineer uh, is like a, a consultant to the water court. Sometimes the division engineer uh, and state engineer feel they have to get into a water case. Other times they don't, and they just help guide the court saying, well, this was, this makes sense, that makes sense, or gee, there's really no water there, or, or whatever the court needs. They improve construction and repair of dams and perform dam safety inspections. They issue license for well drillers and assure a safe and proper construction of water wells. And then I already talked about the, the databases. So they're they're very busy. It's a it's a big organization, uh, but they they are the ones who make sure that water is being administered according to the court decrees. Let me go back. Question? Thoughts? Oh, guys are easy. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm glad you asked because there are, first of all, to be a state engineer, you have to be a registered engineer. However, he has working for him people in the natural resources arena, uh, water engineers, geoscientists, um, just a whole array. You know what? He's got a huge, what I call, communications department where he has to talk. And then he has rules that he has to make for uh, working on these rivers. So he's got lawyers. He's got, you know, folks who understand the law and, and work with it. It's, it's a whole range. The other agency that is more fun, in my opinion, is the Colorado Water Conservation Board. That's the one I headed up a while ago. 
boy, there's a sky's the limit. They've got everything going on. They're, um, they give out money. Uh, they give loans and grants. They're working on uh, watershed development. They're the ones who put together the water plan that Karen was talking about and showed you. They do in-stream flows. So in Colorado, you can have in-stream flows, which means you can protect the water in a certain reach, but only the Colorado Water Conservation Board can hold that water right. So they go out and they appropriate water or they buy and sell water. It's just, there's just a whole gambit. And so I highly recommend you look at these different agencies. The other thing I'll mention, and I know Karen will second this, is looking at NGOs. Because if you go to a government job, you get a lot of responsibility right away. It's a little scary at first. But you get that responsibility and you get that experience. Same thing happens with NGOs, non-governmental entities, like Trout Unlimited. You know, like, uh, that was right, I said that right, right? <laughs> uh, Nature Conservancy. Um, there, there are groups out there that also have depth of um, opportunities where you can actually get on the ground work and meet a lot of people, network, and a lot of responsibility. So looking at water from all those perspectives, I think is a good idea. Are there thoughts, questions? Yes, sir. How much do you do in house and how much do you kind of contracting out to consult with other third parties? They have a lot that they do a lot, both. Okay. It's probably almost an equal, when I was there, we had 45 people. I think they're up to 60 now uh, with water plan. Um, but it is, they do contract. There are a lot of agencies or contractors, you know, engineers and lawyers and stuff like that that they contract for. Another question. Yeah, there's some follow up to what you mentioned that the farmers are reluctant to pay the efficiency because they get a lot of business. Is that a valid? So, I want you to ask Corey DeAngelis this question. And this causes debates in every classroom, wherever you talk about this. The truth of the matter is, if a farmer becomes more efficient, there will be less water in the river. And there is a whole bunch of reasons for that. So... If he's diverting so much, but he's he's putting it on the fields, those plants are only going to use X amount. They're not going to use all that's diverted. So it's kind of a pipe dream sometimes. It's, they'll think that, oh, I, I have a 10 CFS right, but my plants are only using 5 CFS. Nothing happens until he decides he wants to sell that water or he wants to change the use of the water. Then he's restricted. He has to go through a water court proceeding and he's restricted to 5 CFS. That's an excellent question. And there are gobs of papers that have been written exactly on that. I, in fact, had a professor, a retired professor a couple of years ago, arguing with a water court judge about that very issue. Because it sounds counterintuitive, right? And it, um, but there's lots of uh, science out there to show that's that's what happens. And there are a lot of different reasons for it. It's not a reason, you know, farmers are businessmen. They're going to try to be as efficient as they can with whatever they do because, because they want to, they have a business they have to run. But, um, but yeah, they, they feel they're caught in this use it or lose it conundrum. There is a law that was passed a few years ago that allows a farmer or rancher to lease his water right to CWCB for in-stream flows three years out of 10. And he doesn't get nicked for that. It's just assumed that he was using his whole water right, whatever that is. 
So we're starting to come to terms with that. And as we as we reach this drought, we still have these issues of these municipalities are growing. We want to keep we want to keep our rural uh, Colorado, and that that just doesn't always work. And so there's a lot of innovative methods. They're called alternative transfer methods uh, that are being looked at, uh, like the lease three years and 10. So I don't know if that answered the question. Not directly. I don't have a direct answer for you. Yeah, but. I guess, Mary, is there any Going around and finding farmers who can sell pivots and actively trying to get their GFS reduced due to that. I guess in practice, like, are there cases where people have improved irrigation efficiency and are having their wants? <laughs> I apologize to those of you online. I'm answering the questions with, and I'm the one who called Karen on it last time. <laughs> so, um, so the question is, you know, with farmers, what about farmers and efficiencies? And are there people who are actively working with farmers to help them make be more efficient? Yes, there are. There are uh, grants, CWCB has grants to help with respect to that. There are just, as with anything else, there's a lot of complications to that. For instance, you and I look at a field and say, okay, well, you know, instead of alfalfa, you could grow, Joel's gonna be here, right? Black-eyed beans takes less water. Well, except you have a market for your alfalfa. You have a supplier for the seeds. You have the equipment to harvest that. So there's a lot of consideration with respect to that. Those are great questions. And we have Joel Schneeklot here. He's also from the Water Center. Ask him that. And Joel, if you're online, I just, I just pinged you. So there you go. And you have another Zoom request. Can you move around a lot? They can't really hear you. I, I apologize. <laughs> I do that. I'm so sorry. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, you guys talked about the gas topic and my groundwater has always been like this morning. <laughs> um, when you want to follow share a paper, you talked about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a um, Jill the News in 2019 with their groundwater hydraulic model. Um, there's a program in Kansas that opens prior appropriations that is uh, stakeholder led to get irrigators to use less water. So these are three basic ways that they were able to reduce and improve groundwater uh, levels in the level table was by changing the crops, reducing the irrigation depth, or changing the area. And Karen, I can send the, the article to you, but that's like one point. Area, but I know that there's other researchers on our team that have done studies. Yeah. yeah. And Karen, I have another article I'll send to you that's more for the layman than the science aspect of I'm it. Sure will have lots of stuff. I'm sure he will too, but it's um, it's just it's really interesting and it's confounding sometimes. Okay, I'm running out of time. <laughs> Compacts. First of all, do you know what the largest reservoir of water is in Colorado? It is the snowpack. That is where we get our water. That's why we everybody always is watching the snowpack. So we, get, we have this water. This is what we call the snake diagram. I think you have this, student. Okay. Yeah, and uh, it just shows how much water is generated in Colorado and how much leaves Colorado. About three-fourths of the water that we generate here in Colorado goes out to other states. I think there's like 19 other states that depend on our water. Well, we had to figure out how to share that water right. And we had this wonderful attorney rancher around Greeley. His name is Adele Carpenter. This is another reference for you. It's a good history on uh, Western compacts. And he had this idea. He was working with the governor. He was, in, was working with the other states saying, how can we share our water? He did a lot of work with Nebraska, even before he worked on the Colorado River. Figuring out, you know, 
what's how does this how is it flowing what makes it flow how much are the return flows and so uh delft decided uh and proclaimed uh and got accepted that states can come together and write agreements under the compact clause of the US constitution u.s constitution those agreements then are approved by every state legislature and by Congress. So a compact is first a contract, then it's state law, and it's federal law. So the thing about compacts is they're not easy to put together and they're even harder to change. Here's a list of compacts for um, Colorado. Another way to divide water is going to the United States Supreme Court. Wyoming sued Colorado early in the 1900s on the Laramie River. And the Supreme Court decided how much water each state get, got. As well, uh, same thing happened with the North Platte decree between Nebraska and Wyoming. And Colorado has a bit of that. So this is the South Platte. You saw that very similar one last, but I want to, I want you to look hard at this map because remember I told you the the river used to dry up at a certain point, and that point was about there. And you see the line for District fifty sixty four. I'm sorry, you can see the line for District sixty four up in the corner there, and it District sixty four. That's that's part of what they do for uh, administering water rights. And then you have District 1. And where District um, 64 and District 1 meet became a foundation for the agreement between Nebraska and Colorado. So the South Platte contract, uh, Compact basically says Colorado must deliver 120 CFS to Kansas at the state line during the irrigation season. However, only the water rights in dis dis District 64 will be curtailed to meet that 120 CFS. Now, why did they do that? They did that because all of the return flows from the upper reaches of, of, uh, of Division One. Thank you. All those return flows. They did all the, they did this huge study with um, Nebraska, and they realized that because of the irrigation going on, that was just a solid supply. And so Nebraska agreed to that division of only District sixty four being um, curtailed was needed. During the non-irrigation season, there are no restrictions on diversions in Colorado for compact purposes. And as a side note, Colorado has continued to meet its obligations for compact. Corey will tell you a lot more about this. And I, I'm really interested to hear Kansas folks or the Nebraska folks talk about this. But as you all know, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. And a couple of years ago, the Nebraska governor said that they wanted to activate Article 6 in the compact, pretty much an article that had been overlooked. And it talks about the Perkins County Canal Project. In the compact, Colorado consented to the construction of a canal and diversion up to 500 CFS for irrigation in Nebraska during the non-irrigation season. They're not required to deliver 500 CFS. Whatever's in the river is what the Nebraska gets. However, Colorado reserves the right to store an additional 35,000 35, acre feet if and when the canal starts diverting from the river. Now, Joel can tell you a little bit about this. But this these are pictures from 1918 of the Perkins County Canal. 
And this is uh, the lower picture is where the diversion would be made in Colorado. Oh, and by the way, the compact also says that Nebraska can come in and condemn land to make this happen. So at the time, they were moving along on the Perkins County Canal project, and then it just kind of petered out for whatever reason. Well, now Nebraska has picked it back up. You can see on the, the side map there uh, where they would take the water and put it into potential reservoir sites in Nebraska. Now, one of Colorado's concerns with respect to this project is that diversion will interrupt those precious return flows that our farmers in the southern, at the lower part of the South Platte rely on. So there's engineering that needs to be done, things that need to be figured out, and there's environmental uh, concerns that have to also take place. That was a whirlwind of uh, a little bit about law and uh, administration in Colorado. Uh, you're gonna hear from Nebraska folks. I'll be curious to hear what they say about the canal, but also just what do they do with the water south flat? How do they distribute it? Uh, because I'm not going to learn with that. So we have two minutes left for questions. Have... Augmentation, where is the water coming from for augmentation? Well, it could come from a couple different things. Um, it could come from a reservoir. Water's stored in the reservoir and for sale. Um, you can augment with by that water. It comes from wells. Although uh, the interesting conundrum that happened in Colorado is we started drilling so many wells that they started affecting the stream flows. So that that gets kind of iffy. So so that's it, it. All depends on the geology and hydrology with respect to that. Or you can. Um, you know, get a farmer to give up some of his water right and use that. Any other questions? Thoughts? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to know you said that if farmers sell more efficient to end up with more water rights, that is a really They are worried that they will, they are, it doesn't mean they will, but they're worried that they will. Has this happened already? Yes. Okay. And so that's that's what they that's what they look at. They look at, you know, it, and it's hard to tell because you really don't know how much water you have until you do something with it. Like if I've been irrigating on a field, and then I I want to sell it to the municipality, I only get the water. My water right is not what I diverted, but what the plants actually used to grow. That's usually about a fifty percent number. But it varies in other areas. And ask Joel Schneefloff about that. He's doing lots of work. Uh, he's, he's looking at, you know, what if we give plants less water at certain times? Will they still grow? Will they still thrive? So he's been doing a lot of experiments. Anything else? There was a question on Zoom about the timing of flows in relation to water rights and it and they use it to lose that thing. So it was, will there be less water in the river when ag is more efficient, or will there be more in the river early in the season versus, you know, during the irrigation season? Those are great questions. Um, and I'm assuming the people on um, Zoom can see the chat question. Um, and that's why we go to water court. And that's why you have a lot of engineers and lawyers figuring it out because it really is site specific. And so it's, it's just, you just can't say one way or the other. Anything else? Well, thank you for your attention. It's, I know it's a whirlwind. If you have questions, Karen's here. She can give you my, my email. I'm happy to answer it. I'll try to remember to send that article on uh, water efficiency and Enjoy the rest of your day. Did you have some All right, thanks everybody. Don't forget about the little quiz. Um, but if you
12 midnight next Tuesday. I'll remind you again now. Everybody, 